Hey everybody, so welcome to the Summer 2024 Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase where I review some of the new tools out there in the Knowledge Graph space. I do this completely on my own. I have no relationship with any of the companies that I review. I get no sponsorships, I get no kickbacks, I get nothing. Uh, I do this because I like to see what new tools are out there and see what they're all about. And it seems like all of you appreciate being able to also see those uh, and not necessarily have to reach out to the salespeople right away or get more of a biased view from the vendor themselves. And I forgot to film which tool we are going to be reviewing today. So that one, that's the one that we're going to be reviewing today. If you're wondering where I am, there's another video coming on that soon. Uh, but also make sure you stick around to the very end of the video because my honest review is written up at the very end and throughout the whole process, I ask questions as we go and hopefully that helps you if you're interested in this. If not, at least it's entertaining, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let's go get started. Hi, uh, I'm Ian Bailey. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Telison. We're a UK company. Um, we are building, and have built in fact, um, an open source uh, technology stack around managing graph data. It's all about open data standards, open source software, that kind of thing. We've done, a lot of our initial work in the government sector, particularly around defence and security. Uh, so you'll probably see some some defence and security style things in in the in the products as we go along. But yeah, that's awesome. Nice. Yeah, and I think that the, I so I used to work and on a lot of the government uh, stuff uh, in this space. So I'm very keen to see what you're all about because it is a unique space, but I think it's also some of the uniqueness would be helpful to folks not in the government space. Okay, right. I, I'll just give a very quick description of what it is. So um, we kept seeing a pattern in use, and not just in government, but everywhere really, that um, people had a lot of low level, low quality, high volume data streaming through products like Apache Kafka, in fact, say like Apache Kafka, it's nearly always Apache Kafka <laughs> these days. Um, and they just didn't know what to do with all that volume of data. So they were storing it um, at great cost sometimes, never really extracting much value from it. So we saw an opportunity to build uh, an opinionated platform that could watch that data streaming in, those events coming through, mm -hmm. provide... Um, some machine learning and ETL to extract meaning from that data as it flies by, notice significant events in the data. You can see why defense and security might be interested in things like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uplift those events to knowledge. So okay. that's where the ontologies come in. Uh, so we decided to build effectively an opinionated platform. It, it, it ships with an ontology built into it. We we chose an, a, an open government ontology that's been around for a while. Nice. With IES. Um, that was a deliberate choice because that's something I, for, for donkey's years, did a lot of consultancy work across multiple sectors. And if there's one thing you can guarantee in big organisations these days, there are no data models left. No. You, know, you never find them. So... <laughs> It, giving people a good ontology to get started with is 90% of the, yeah. of the, of, of the startup. Really. I, I'm, so. I'm so happy to hear that you're using something that's open and known and like, I, I, no, no, no offense to the other uh, models that are out there that are not open, but um, that's how you get a lot of that good interoperability, a lot of shared learnings. And especially if you're doing things with governments, especially, you know, in, in your region, a lot of government, you know, sharing of information. I know I've worked with, um, the ISA, like you stuff where you have to like share different information across, you know, different countries. Interoperability is pretty important. <laughs> uh, you know, that's the niche we've entered. It's like every startup, you never quite know what what your they call it product market fit don't they but you never really quite know what niche you'll end up in yeah. and we've kind of ended up in those customers where they have complex interoperability problems where they yeah. need data standards they're sharing data at the boundary and so on um and as well which you know we've built in some interesting security features but i guess you probably just want to see it running really yes um, Yes. Okay. Right. So this is our search application, the imaginatively called Telescent Search. Um, <laughs> and really what's going on here is I mentioned Apache Kafka earlier. Inside our platform, we have Apache Kafka. 
Um, and that is doing all the ingest of your bulk data that flies by. But we're also storing the RDF uh, in, in Apache Kafka as well. So we end up with an event log, a sequential immutable log of RDF data events as they come mm -hmm. through. That's for a couple of reasons. What One, um, we want to be able to run multiple databases off it. So as you mm -hmm. scale up into the number of users scale up, we want to be mm -hmm. able to put additional uh, data, graph databases. We use Apache Jenna. In fact, um, Andy Seaborn and Rob Vessi are, are, are part of our development team. They're the guys who kind of built it in the first place. Um, so uh, we, we we have the graph database there, but we also have a search index. So we can mm -hmm. use either Elasticsearch or OpenSearch, depending on, on your preferences. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have is, a, again, it's an opinionated thing. We have a way of detecting entities in the data as it flies by. Nice. Uh, special source in that. And that enables us to build entity-centric search documents. Oh, that's awesome. So that's usually the first point of entry into the platform. So I mentioned earlier, everything's open source. The apps are not open source, though. Uh, we, we've still got to behave like a business occasionally and, and, and make some money from these things. So uh, the apps tend to be bundled in with our, mm -hmm. our support packages and that kind of thing. Um, so I won't, I won't think on that kind of stuff for too long. So um, before you go on, so when you are saying that you are creating these entity-centric documents, sounds a lot like some of the things that people are also looking into when it comes to uh, using knowledge graphs and RAG and LLM. So I... There is a, we have got that going. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. we, we, we've we just got to an internal alpha. I mean, everybody's doing RAG these days, aren't they? Of course. But one of our customers bought, bought our product and then said, actually, what we've got is all this unstructured data. What can you do with it? Um, they had their own preferred entity extraction, relationship extraction code. So uh, we've now got a pipeline coming in that pulls documents in, extracts entities from it. I, what we do, we quarantine those entities because we're trying to keep that knowledge topic in mm -hmm. Apache Kafka as your kind of gold standard mm -hmm. knowledge mm -hmm. of your organization. Uh, so we don't let them go straight into the knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. I think there's still got to be that kind of human in the loop thing, yep. uh, particularly, you know, if it's if it's important data, safety critical data, anything like that, you don't really want a machine deciding what becomes what I'm talking <laughs> Yes. But especially an LP, it's not quite there yet. Um, so, yeah, we have got that. I, I, I won't be demonstrating that today because I say we're just an internal alpha at the yeah. moment. But, yeah, RAG's really interesting, actually. Yeah. That it presents some security issues. I have to say, of course, of course. Um, when I when I explain our security model in a bit, you'll see why RAG might pose a problem for some of these kind of specialist security requirements mm -hmm. customers have. But yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's an interesting area. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. so, so that's usually where you, where you end up. Um, what, so what really what's happening is the algorithms are gathering together little fragments of RDF graph uh, that they think is, are relevant to a topic and building a search document around mm -hmm. that. Um, so uh, the data I've got in here, it's not the most exciting data in the world. It's about flood data um, on, on the Isle of Wight in the UK. We were we were selected as the um, as the data platforms the uk national digital twin program hmm. so this is digital twin data around uh geographic areas and flooding and critical infrastructure and things like that so what you're looking at here uh this is all open data that's been scraped and brought okay. in to the to the platform so this is generally picked up from places like open street map and things like that um and what it's found um is a flood area in fact it's found two flood areas found a flood watch area and a flood area so that uh, that's again open data. The UK government uh, maintains a flood warning mm -hmm. system, and you can scrape that historical data from it. And you can also get the geographical areas that correspond to it. And these are two geographical areas that correspond. So to these it. are historical, right? So usually you see a flood watch, and that's something that's like an event happening now. But this is this is historical data, correct? It, well, actually, yeah, yeah, these are actually just geographical areas. These ones. Okay. We've got uh, we've got some other stuff. We've got uh, 
a high voltage substation or railway station, but it, these are just search matches that it's found. I gotcha. Okay. So, so the interesting thing about this is you can see the the uh, the, the, the the these are basically the RDFS. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, these are entities, not documents. There are there are there is some text around it, so there's quite a bit of text. I think that's been scraped probably from. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia or from the, the the Isle of Wight Council site, um, that you you get this additional information around it, um, like that, that's an RDFS comment, for example, but it's got a mm -hmm. name. Um, but we tried to present it in a much more user centric way through this. Mm -hmm. Some of the other apps are a little bit more graph and RDFS. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of idea. Um, and then from there. Because we got this, because we standardized the data first in in the in the event streaming uh, pipelines, the same data that goes into the search index also goes into the knowledge graph. So nice. Apache Jenner also picks up the, the same data as well. So it's very easy from one app to another to just jump from from uh, one piece of data to another. So if I click on the graph link there, there'll be a slight delay while some some containers warm up. But this is basically our graph app, and that's the same thing you were looking at before. But now I can navigate around, and this will start to look at yep. people who kind of dealt with this kind of thing before. I mean, it's not the prettiest data set in the world because they've all got long and horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you get the idea. You can you can jump from one to another. There's geo information against these, so that flood area there, uh, I can light it up on the map. So mm -hmm. if I jump from there that's just pulling out some attached geo json against that flood area and showing it on the uh on the map there is there a um, way to customize some of the, of the visual because as you said some of the the names are quite long and unwieldy uh yeah yeah i i think in this particular case this was probably the only data set we've got that's public so it, it's um Probably not the the the. the so most you could put like RDF's label in there, and it'll just yeah. Well, you've yeah. got one there, in fact. So St John's Ride, that's a label that it, it's, gotcha. got, it's got a label attached to it, so it's picked it up. But in the underlying data, there is no label for that, so it just shows the mm -hmm. URI. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of context sensitive; it knows whether mm -hmm. there's a, a label or not, and it will use it. Great. For five. Um, but yeah, that that's basically it. And then um, if I pick these, you can see there's a timeline down the bottom. So. Yep. The ontology that I mentioned that we use in this is what's known as a 4D ontology. You might have bumped into a few of those over the years. Um, and the nice thing about 4D ontologies is they're very good at describing what happened where and when. Okay. Um, so we there we pick, I've just clicked on two items in the graph, and they're both being shown on the timeline there, and I can compare their comparative events about where, when modeling. yeah and event modeling in ontologies is is never that that easy and i think you mentioned it earlier uh which ontology are you using again we're using ies that's one that came out of the kind of defense and security community okay. originally in uk government but um it's now i'd say the majority of the use it gets is in the digital twin sector so yeah. it's been used on on quite a few digital twin projects like this one which would uh, make sense as to why it does event modeling well <laughs> you kind of have uh, to yeah yeah what what happened where and when it, the other thing it does and this gets really fascinating it, it does it has a possible world's model mm -hmm. along the lines of like you know these kind of sci-fi movies of um multiple parallel truths mm -hmm. um, because the law enforcement and kind of national security guys deal with very vague and contradictory information yeah. And you get so they model out every scenario that is a possibility from from an event happening. Yeah, yeah, and that gets really. I mean, we're back into machine learning again, but it gets really intractable really quickly if you're trying yeah. to do nets over yep. the, the knowledge graphs. But if you've got a bunch of facts that are true in one possible world, another bunch of facts that are true in another possible world, you can then reason over the possible worlds mm -hmm. instead of the individual facts. Mm -hmm. So. It becomes much more tractable problem to do. Yeah, so, which I love that. And that's why I I wish, I know there's a whole subgenre of graph that is IoT focused and digital twin focused. Um, I find that all of that space so fascinating and so interesting. And I actually feel like that, and don't get me wrong, like graph has a lot of promise in a lot of different areas. You know, that that kind of cyber physical, yeah. not just digital, it's not, I mean, it isn't just digital twins. It can be anything from... Yep. 
intelligence sharing to yep. situation awareness. We do a lot of that kind of work in the military. Um, anything that requires accurate models of the real world, that's when mm -hmm. these kind of knowledge graphs and RDF and mm -hmm. ontology really come into their own. Yep. They're less well suited to you know, financial transactions and things like that, which are kind of <laughs> more tabular in nature. But for this kind of stuff, they're awesome. They work really well. Yeah. And, you know, I, there's there's a lot of things that I've seen where, you know, outside of like law enforcement and other things like, you know, um, news news events, right, where there is potentially an article being released like every few minutes on an event that is literally happening as we speak. If you wanted to use that data and start to do predictive analytics on it with with graph data, you could start to figure out, well, you know, what would it what would happen here or there? And and if you're you know, law enforcement or somebody that um, is trying to help those maybe in the line of a flood or a hurricane or something that is an active safety event that's happening, um, Graph is really, really powerful when you start to use it for that. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm a big fan. We did, did a lot of this work for, for years around ontologies. And now I, I personally am a big fan of the 4D ontologies, you know, the stuff that started in the back in, I'm old enough to remember when they first started doing it in the late 90s, and they're, they're, they're still in use. It, it, it can be a little bit niche, but generally where, like you say, stuff changes over time, where and when, they're, they're great for that kind of thing. So we have this idea of a secure access control boundary on the platform. So data comes in, uh, goes on to, we, 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 we batch it up generally, and then we buffer it onto Apache Kafka, which is, you know, in terms of scalability, we've not been able to break it. We've thrown a ton of data at Apache Kafka and never been able to uh, to break it. It really, really does scale very well. And it's free open source software, which is fantastic. Um, we put the data onto that, and then we process it, and we uplift it, and we extract the knowledge from it. And then we push that knowledge into things we call smart caches. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fairly, not the best name for it really, but really smart caches are are our name for what is basically a database plus secure redaction at the boundary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the case of Jenna, we've built in uh, a redaction agent that redacts before the query engine. Mm. There, are, there are reasons for that. It's, if you try to do redaction after a query, data can slip through. So we, we do okay. the redaction. So we've built it into the Jenna stack <laughs> and an API. And that's it, really. So the way our platform works is your user auths in. Once the user's auth in, the platform takes care of the security, and I can go into the details on that in a little bit. But mm -hmm. the idea was originally to build an open source platform with an opinionated ontology so you could get going on day one. And we've done that with quite a few customers across a number of domains now around digital twins, around government, around energy systems, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and so but, are, 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 I'm assuming folks can, can add to that ontology, and if they can... Um, how does the machine learning handle that? Is there like additional training they would have to do? Like, how does that look? No, so we don't. The only the only bit of machine learning we've got on the in on the ingest side of it is the entity extraction. Okay. And they tend to come with their own set of event, of classes that they recognise. Although, mm -hmm. if there's some of the large language model ones that are out there now you can tell them what classes to look for mm -hmm. and they'll go look for them. But we haven't really worked with those ones yet. But the the more traditional ones, the ones where the compute cost isn't horrific, because that's the other thing to can do, right? You, you want to run NLP with a very large language model over gazillions of documents, it's going to cost you a lot. Yep. Yep. I think people uh, are starting to realize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, particularly if you're using GPUs, it gets very pricey very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, we've tended to use more economical, smaller language models, the mm -hmm. likes of Roberta and Bert and Spacey and things like that, mm -hmm. which don't eat enormous amounts of compute mm -hmm. and you can chuck a ton of documents at them. And they're only a few percent worse than the really big ones. So it's a dimension. On entity resolution, you're just saying. Uh, for entity extraction. Extraction, and yeah. We, yeah, we and then did, you have to do the resolution part. The yeah, resolution's really tricky. We we yeah. got a we started using something called Zentity. I don't know if you ever encountered that. Zentity was uh, built by the the Elastic Search guys. They don't maintain that anymore. 
So we, we've had to kind of build our own version of that, which is good in a way. Yeah. But we have a very rudimentary entity resolver in the platform mm. as well, which uses search, same same as Entity did, same sort of idea. We score it differently, uh, but it uses search to to try and find mm -hmm. matches and score them. as. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's it basically. So the, the bit I wanted to show you that that's the boring bit, um, the really cool bit, and the thing that people seem to like about our software is we have this idea of label based security. Now this is this is something that happens in a lot of kind of government areas. Mm -hmm. um, you get data from lots of different places, and they've all got different security and handling requirements around that data. So what we try to do is as the data is flowing into the system, we label it as it comes in. Sometimes, if you're lucky, the system you're getting it from will supply it with security labels on it. So that might say, you know, you have to be an employee of the company, mm -hmm. you have to be part of the management team, and you have to be something else in order to see this data. Mm -hmm. That's great on a system-by-system -system basis. That's been done for donkey's years. You know, you, you, you control your access that way. When you start to build these data platforms where the data is coming from all over the mm -hmm. place with a very mixed security model, that just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So the opportunity there that we've addressed is we label the data and the data carries its security labels as metadata around with it wherever mm -hmm. it goes to the platform. So when we, when we merge all that data and build a knowledge graph from it, it retains all the security with it mm -hmm. so that when a user comes in, and they want to look at this combined data. So they come in, in this particular case, you know, we use color codes for the labels mm -hmm. and user attributes, but we compare the user's credentials with the data, and we only let that data they're allowed to see out. And they're not mm -hmm. even aware that the data exists. So you get a redacted graph and a yep. redacted search document and all that. Well, when you have a redacted graph, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen this happen. When you redact like that, there's always the the risk of having a bunch of holes in it. And if you're using anything like um, machine learning on connected data, like GraphML, and you're trying to do a shortest path, but now the shortest path isn't the real shortest path because data is missing from the graph because your your version is redacted. Have you come across any issues with that? Uh, not issues as such. Um, I mean, I, I guess in... Um... In, in these organizations, I and mean, it is mostly government, but you also find it in banking, you find it in pharmaceutical and healthcare as well. Um, the need for privacy kind of trumps the need to be able to do it. Okay. So they don't really care about that. I think they'd start to care if it became obvious what's been redacted. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if there was a lot of circumstantial data around it that could that you could infer. That's mm -hmm. where the concerns would be. So you, okay. you've got to be careful to apply your labels appropriately. But mm -hmm. you know, most most of these information security officers in, in these big organizations, they're pretty clued up on how to do that. Okay, so. well, that's good. So, and and a little part of, I mean, I know you're not using blockchain, but it kind of like ish sounds like blockchain a little bit where everything kind of just, the, the security and the metadata travels with the data itself. Is it similar to that? Well, it, yeah, kind of. Well, kind of and kind of not. <laughs> so when we first started, we were we were trying to get venture capital. We've not we've not taken any external investment in the in the company. We were we were lucky enough to to have a product fair that we could build fairly quickly and and start to get customers using. So we we kind of run on revenues. But um, when we were trying to get VC, they're all asking, "What's the blockchain angle on this? What's <laughs> the because uh, they've got their little tick box." Oh, of course, yeah. Um, and we did think about blockchain instead of Kafka, but it just didn't scale or perform in the way mm -hmm, they could. Mm -hmm. um, we think we have a potential use for it, which is when you our knowledge log is an immutable log in, in Kafka. So it's a strictly temporally ordered log. Um, there are some, some areas, particularly, say, pharmaceutical or banking, where, where they're investigated. The investigator might say, what did you know on this particular date? Or, or you could imagine that with the police mm -hmm. as well. Police have been investigated for something. What did you know on this particular date when this thing happened? The nice thing about having that strict temporal log is you can effectively push the clock back mm -hmm. and get a different epistemic view of, mm -hmm. of the 
data holdings were on that particular day. But to know it hasn't been tempered with, that's where blockchain might come in. So, you know, you I could see. take a, a hash of each entry yep. on that and put that on the blockchain, and then you would have a definite legal proof that, that mm -hmm. you know, the sysadmin hasn't gone in and manipulated the data or something like that. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, if you were the person that um, needed to, to make sure that you understood on the back end of things, is there a UI for that? Or is it all like a Jupyter notebook kind of thing? Or, you know, if I was trying to make sure that I knew the ETL was working, because you said there's like a human in the loop aspect to some of that, like, what does that look like? So at the moment, we push the data that needs triage onto a triage topic in Kafka, and then you pick it up from there and, and work through it. Um, on the ETL side of it, we had this grand scheme that we would build our own ETL engine inside on top of Kafka. <laughs> and we started to write all the Python code for that. But as soon as you hit a customer site and deploy, you realize they've got their own in-house ETL tools. Yep. They're all using, you know, Airflow or, so, or something similar mm -hmm. to that. Um, then didn't really seem to be much point investing a ton of effort when mm -hmm. they were just going to do something else anyway. Um, so then they would do their own ETL into the ontology that that you have. Yeah, and actually, okay. fact, what we what we tended to do because you it, you must have encountered this a, a lot as well. It's very rare to find those kind of knowledge graph and ontology skills yeah. in these organisations. Um, but they do have data engineers who understand JSON, CSV, and so on. So what we've tended to do is create intermediate canonical data forms that are a bit flatter, less graph-like. Mm -hmm. And then we have our own little ETL engine that understands that intermediate format. I gotcha. Converts it to the ontology and pushes it in. Yep. Okay. That makes, that just, makes sense. Yeah. Kind of lowers the bar for the data engineers. They don't have to yeah. go and do a master's in graph technology to <laughs> work this out. So, you know... The, that's really helped onboarding data, we think. Okay. And so when the ETL is happening, you said some of the data will come in with some of those security pieces already tagged to it. Um, but if it doesn't, is that on the client side ETL or is that something your ETL is helping them establish? Uh, we can do both. So we can set a default label for a particular data source at the moment that's in hardwired config files. So, mm -hmm, have, mm -hmm. so then um, they would have to work with you to get that in. That, yeah, or they could do it themselves. But you're absolutely right. That is an area where security folks get involved and they're not always developers and they yes. don't maybe you know, don't want to work with config files. So we're doing a little bit of work at the moment to build a very, very lightweight, we're calling it a data catalog. And I guess kind of is it does it uses DCAT three, you know, the DCAT uh, ontology for the data catalog. So it uses DCAT, um, but it's basically a way to register the data sources you're pulling in mm, and mm -hmm. DCAT by to say, uh, and here's the default security label for anything. Mm -hmm. You can override it if you've got mm -hmm. additional security, but um, that so that's what we're working on at the moment, and that will have a more of a, a, a graphical user interface to make it. Bit yeah. easy for those policy folks to work yeah. with who don't want to work with What if somebody has their own data catalog? I mean, there's some big major ones out there. Um, yeah, we 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 bumped into one of them so far, one of one of the big commercial ones. Um it did have APIs in there, but they didn't seem to support any of the open standards. So mm -hmm. in case by case basis, yeah. it's just like any kind of data re-engineering task just has yeah. to be metadata in that case.